But then that's not the end of the chain, is it? What happens when uh, the cashier, you know, let's say he gets a dollar out of like every five dollars he spends, it's an arbitrary number. Where, where, where does that dollar go? So what do you do when, so I mean, uh, you work at Subway, let's say, or uh, Specs, and the owner pays you a seven dollars an hour, right? So what do you do then, like, with the money you get? Buy food. Yeah. You buy, food. buy food, buy clothing. Pay um, pay yeah, taxes. anything, right? And then what does the person do who you buy the clothes from and he gets money. Same thing. Same thing. There you go. Right. So all of these economic <laughs> decisions, your propensity to save or your propensity to spend, it's all you know uh, intertwined. And and your spending is someone else's income and their spending is your income and vice versa. And realistically it's these sort of like micro level uh, consumer spending decisions, right? That implicate sort of the economic performance on a macro level as as a whole. Yeah. So this class is called the travels of the dollar in the U.S. economy. But before we get uh, back to that, we just wanted to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Raj Salobra. I'm a junior Ooh. at Sid. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Rahul Recky. I'm also a junior at Sid. So I guess we'll just put our like email. I guess, so I mean, uh, can everyone pull up the syllabus or those of I can pull it up here. So this is the syllabus. It's online. So we're trying to be environmentally friendly here. Right? Right. So, don't worry about so we have our emails there. Um, we have been these um, office hours uh, during lunch at McMurtry. If anyone wants to come talk about you know, any of the policy issues we talked about or anything related to politics. Yeah, Free Zakaria. Free Zakaria. Free Zakaria. Yeah, we're hearing a lot about Free Zakaria. So, you know, our office hours are not obviously in the same way of like, you know, like a math class where you're going to sit there and ask us about these models. Right? I mean, they're very open ended. Anything you see in the news, anything a candidate talks about, anything we discuss, topics that discuss in class, I mean, really anything you want. small assignments for the class. Um, so I mean, I think as 
most people know, we have a think tank on campus, the FA for Institute, right? And uh, they have like amazing events all the time. So uh, the assignments are you need to go to two of the events throughout the year. Um, there'll be like at least 30 probably this year, so you can go to two of them. And then just submit two 200 word reflection papers. So one reflection paper uh, per exam. Does that make sense? And it's only 200 words, so that's not that hard. So uh, the place you can find the events is if you go to uh, bakerinstitute.org uh, slash events, you can uh, see all the events here. So you know these are just like a few of them. So I think maybe this one's interesting. You know, you know, social policy and health policy. Um, and then you can like read about the description here, like who's going to be there, and then you can just like click this to RSVP, fill in all your stuff, and then you're set. And, and the reason we're offering these assignments is we don't need onerous, right? So we understand that one of the basic selling points is cost, that you, know, you really have a lot of time to sit there and learn about policy all day. A lot of you, something like 70 to 80 percent of the cost is like science engineering majors. So I'm a bi -we. I know how hard and how much time problem sets can take. But so you don't need to be necessarily spending seven hours a day and reading the news to know enough to get by. And one of the things that happens is Baker Institute has these like amazing events um, week in, week out. I mean, they, they bring in like really high profile people. We had like the president of the World Bank, former Treasury Secretaries, I mean, pretty much anyone you can think of. Uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, last semester was also a notable one. But um, they tend to be pretty uh, under attended by Rice students. And we feel like a lot of that is just breaking the ice. Um, if you haven't, once you go there, you're going to be stuck right there more often. So hopefully this will facilitate that. Um, so that's basically it for the administrative stuff. We just wanted, though, to ask a quick question. Um, sort of what did, do people hope to get out of the class? Like, why do people sign up for it? Because, like, that'll help us can try and tailor the class uh, better. So, I mean, if you know now, that's great. I guess not, you can uh, send us an email. If you don't want to say it at the end of your class, whatever, it's fine. Um, so just so, like, we can, you know, try and make the class more uh, tailored to everyone's sort of desires and needs. Yeah, and then periodically we'll do um, outfit polls. Um, we last year we did one at the beginning, of, towards the beginning of the semester, um, just asking for feedback on the class. If there's anything you want that we're not offering, and you need to adjust. Um, so again, we're trying to make this as uh, interactive and dynamic as possible. So any questions, comments, concerns about? Yeah. Um, did you guys maybe create like a website where you put all your stuff that's not on Alpha? We can add you to the owl space. Yeah. Oh, you can? So just uh, come see us at the end of class. Or first of all, use your, if you just uh, send us an email yeah, with your right. student ID, and we'll put it on. Awesome. So, that'll be perfect. so if you're not in, yeah, we can just do that very easily. So just send us yeah, an email. Yeah, make sure you're just yeah, the thing. Yeah, so yeah. basically, I mean, long story short, I mean, the, the dean, dean Hutchins office, dean Hutchins office uh, has this new cap this semester where it's like all student taught classes, like no one can go above 19. And we've been unable to lobby them to change that for whatever reason. But the, the upshot is, if you, um, we have a few, a few ideas we can play around with this. One is that if you're not formally registered, you can still get you in the owl space, and I mean, still be treated as any other student in your class. And, and please keep coming. And please keep coming. I mean, it's more than um, happy to have you here. Presumably, the, the transcript little line is not what <laughs> you guys signed up um, this class for. It's not much of a benefit there. So um, you'll still be able to get all sort of like the notes and class experience. Uh, you can also audit the class. Um, we had one person do this. Someone did that last year. semester. I don't think there's any cap for that. No. So that way, it would you know, show up on your transcript if that's what you're looking for. So um, just talk with us. You know, um, you're kind of like confused about what to do. Anything else for right now? Okay. Should we uh, get going? Yeah, I guess the last thing is um, we have these um, outlines that we use to kind of prepare the lecture, um, little notes that are useful to reference later on. So. Generally, what we try to do is upload them before the class. Um, this is actually based on a student recommendation from our from class last semester. So you can kind of follow along as you go along if you bring your laptop and iPad. Sometimes we have to go pretty quickly. I don't know how you should answer that question. Okay. So we just go to reflections. So we do this. All right. So, so you get the lights or you think it's okay? Is it okay for everybody or do we want to turn the lights off? Can everyone see the board? So uh, fiscal policy, so we just have to get a few definitions out of the way and then we're going to go into more of the uh, policy uh, stuff. So fiscal policy, uh, you guys may have heard this as a term before, but it just means the use of government expenditure, right? So that's spending by the government. 
and revenue collection <coughs> and taxation to influence the economy. Right. So, so very simply, fiscal policy, you really only need to know the two words, tax and spend. That's, that's really all it comes down to. Government's ability to tax, government's ability to spend. And sort of how you balance those two, um, whether you're a policymaker in Washington or whether you're trying to vote in Kansas to have sort of different uh, preferences for each one, determines in large part how an economy behaves. Because what we talked about so yeah, so these are just three of the numerous types of uh, taxes that we have in this country. So income tax, this is what I mean, we all pay, right? I mean, whenever you like make your salary, you get charged a certain rate depending on uh, the amount of uh, money you earn. Uh, capital gains tax, does anyone know what that is? So capital, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that's what you earn on stuff you've invested in stocks or yeah, exactly, bonds. Right, exactly, exactly. So I mean, if you buy a share of a Google at $100 and sell it at $200, made 100 bucks. That 100 bucks is called a capital gain, and then it's taxed at a different rate than your income tax, it's taxed at a 15%. Okay. And the last one is corporate taxes. So businesses are charged uh, taxes on their uh, profits. Right? And, and the reason this is relevant is because, you know, I mean, this is kind of a, a very obvious thing to say, but how the government takes in revenue and how much it takes will determine how it can spend and how much it can spend, right? It's a pretty obvious one there. Um, and realistically, these sort of tax policies have a pretty big impact on people's like daily livelihoods, right? So as you can imagine, um, income tax, which is always a big debate, you know, um, controlling sort of which income levels are taxed at which rates can affect someone's bottom line pretty significantly, especially you know, those on, on a lower or middle income level. Um, so then on the other side, we have spending. Um, and there's two sort of broad uh, spending uh, types of spending, right? There's discretionary spending uh, and non-discretionary spending, right? So discretionary spending is basically anything you have a choice about. So like education or uh, the EPA or um, what else? Education, EPA, um, research, research energy, investments. energy investments, things like that. Non-discretionary are basically what the government has to pay. So they're sort of like just like a few broad uh, categories for this. So one is like Medicare, Medicaid, right, Social Security, and defense. Those are the big ones. Um, and, and there's like one more, which is uh, interest, but we'll explain that uh, in the next couple slides. Yeah, yeah. But, but what's really interesting here is, um, you know, we talk about misinformation in Japan. And, and one of the principal sort of uh, examples of misinformation is on a very basic level, so we wanted to kind of get a sense of what you guys think. Um, how do you think the government spends its money? So of all the money and, and, and uh, dollars that are raised through various taxation schemes, which we'll get into, um, what we outlined in the very basic level, how do you think the U.S. spends its money? So, so maybe everyone, these yeah. Categories oh yeah, so these are, let me get out of the way here. Yeah. These are sort of five broad categories, um, made it simple for you guys. Defense, uh, discretionary, uh, entitlements, entitlements are Medicare, Medicaid, pension, social security, social security yeah. those things. Interest on our debt and foreign aid. And um, you know, you guys don't have to turn this in or anything, so we're not expecting you to be experts here, but we just want to give you get you get a general sense of where you stand on this issue. So maybe if everyone could just take a minute um, and then you just like write it down in your notebook and uh, try, try to get a general show of hands here. So if someone wants to, you know, make a guess once they uh, complete their percentage breakdown, uh, make sure it has sums to 100. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess something around. Hold on, let me put it in. Huge 
a huge percentage on defense, something like 40%, 40, yeah. 50%. 40, okay. Um, discretionary, probably our fly cuts, let's say around like 15% on discretionary, 15, 15 okay. on entitlement. Okay. Um, well, actually like 20, 20 maybe. Okay, 20, 20. Change that. Okay. <laughs> and then 3% for an aid. 3% for an aid. Um, and 17? Nah, three percent interest, and then change the discretionary entitlement. It's like major, <laughs> major defense so entitlement. Just to be like the discretionary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> this is the the Baha'i budget right yeah. here. <laughs> um, so Why let's get a. So presumably not everyone agrees with this, right? So does anyone have anything that's you know substantially different than? What your general feeling is about, about the U.S. I know you both don't be shy. Joy surprise. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit less on defense. Um, a little so bit more, maybe like thirty percent. Okay. And then um, maybe like twenty-five. Okay. And then like domestic, like thirty. Okay. Um, like thirty-five percent of the same time. I don't know what it's grabbing. So basically, like, so you're, you're favoring kind of taking a chunk out of defense. Discretionary is basically the same, but you're saying interest and foreign rate are significantly higher. Okay. And, One more. and so what, what was your name? We're trying to learn. Oh, Emily. Emily, okay. Fahad. So we have Emily and Fahad. Um, fairly different. Should we get a third one? Yeah, we should get a third one. Yeah. <laughs> from the actual results. Um, but, so what are the striking issues here? 
how you monetize. Um, and, and so the big one is this non-discretionary spending, right? This is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Um, so some people have described the U.S. government as an insurance company with an army, right? So here's the insurance company, right, 40, and then here's the army, 24. Right? So 65% of the budget goes to the insurance and the army. And then only 28%, which is really not that much, goes to like every other department in the government. So education, EPA, research, uh, you know, uh, Andy, Andy. food and drug administration, every single other department, you can think of interior. Um, that's really not that much. Uh, and then interest, this is basically, the government has debt and has to pay interest on that, just like everyone else does. So 6% of the budget goes just for interest. So we just wanted to just give you guys a picture of what because really, you know, we have to start with what are our spending needs first before we can kind of get into how we finance those spending needs. And this will come up more. We'll talk about more about the budget later on. But um, what's really interesting because you know recently in the last year or so we've had a lot of like discussions about U.S. budget. We're going to have more um, over the summer. I don't know how many of you guys um, sort of caught the whole debt ceiling uh, craziness, it's right? It was dominating the airways. Yeah. I mean, a big part of that is you can't seriously balance the budget, talk about balancing the budget, without tackling. Everything else is just drops in the bucket compared to the other stuff. And, and that's often not really talked about um, about the general population. So it's a very nice example. All right, so moving uh, rapidly forward here. Um, so we just wanted to talk a little bit now about uh, taxation. Um, so in the United States, we have something called progressive taxation. Um, and I think this quote is good to sort of summarize exactly what we mean by that. So Mr. Buffett, this is a uh, Warren Buffett, obviously the second richest man in the country, right, said that he was taxed at 17.7% on the $46 million he made last year without trying to avoid paying higher taxes, while his secretary who earned 60000 was taxed at 30%. Yeah, and so th the reason we bring this quote up, um, it illustrates sort of how these, um, the interplay of like the various taxation schemes that are out there that we outlined earlier affect how money is raised. And we want to show you the budget first because, um, you know, now we kind of step back and see, well, how do we pay for all this, right? So, th so the reason, well, bu Warren Buffett's quote illustrates sort of the fundamental difference between capital gains and, and income tax, right? So uh, Warren Buffett's secretary, who basically earns a wage, a standard wage, um, is taxed at her income bracket, which you know, comes out to around 30%. But uh, since Warren Buffett makes most of his money through investments, um, he only gets taxed at the capital gains rate, which is um, around 15%. And that's interesting because you know, what that implies is that sort of our, our taxation system has to evolve based on sort of how dominant or basically what percentage of people earn a significant amount of money through investments. Or, or there's this big debate, right? I mean, should that should that take that into account? But but stepping back a little, um, fundamentally, our income tax, uh, as as Raj said, is a progressive tax. Okay, so the basic idea behind a progressive taxation scheme is that sort of the more you make as you go up a greater percentage of your income goes towards taxes. So um, think about it like this. Let's say you make $100,000, okay? Um, we have different brackets right now. So, so this first bracket might be from zero to like $30,000. Maybe you're taxed at like 5%, right? And the next bracket will be from 30K to 60K, and you're taxed at like 10%, right? And so on. The brackets continue to go up until you get to 250000 plus, and you're taxed at a 35%. So, depending on the amount you make, you sort of land within one of the brackets. Um, and the way the taxation works is on the first $30,000 you make, you're taxed at the 5%, right? And then on the next 30,000 you make, so the 30,000, so the $30,001 to the $60,000 you made, you're taxed at 10%. And then on the next dollar you make, you're taxed at 15, and so on. Does that make sense to everyone how the tax system works? So it's progressive in the sense that as you make more and more money, right, you pay a higher and higher rate. Okay, and this is um, the exact opposite of something else, which I'll just mention very briefly, called the flat tax. Okay, and the flat
flat tax basically says if you make, uh, no matter what amount you make, we all pay 10%, or we all pay 20%, or we all pay 30%. It doesn't matter how much money you make. So that's not progressive. That's called the flat tax, and we currently have a progressive scheme. But, but this is, I've talked about a lot, uh, depending on like, which policy you sort of believe in. And, and the reason it's talked about, I mean, you might be asking me, so what's the rationale behind the progressive scheme? And the basic idea is that you know, everyone, every one of us kind of sets aside a certain amount of spending for basic necessities, right? Food, water, water, clothing, shelter, and by and large, um, sort of these are like the minimum requirements. So if you're, even if you're making like 10,000 a year, you're gonna set, set aside a fixed proportion of your income for these needs, and the more you make, the smaller percentage of your income goes towards paying for those basic necessities, right? Um, pretty, pretty common sense there. So what ends up happening is that in a flat tax system, um, a flat tax system is considered a, a regressive system simply because if everyone is taxed at 10%, if you're only earning $10,000, where um, let's say five, it takes $5,000 to cover your basic necessities, that hits you more, um, more hard than if you are making a million dollars and you're taxed at, uh, and, and only the same amount, the $5,000 to cover your basic necessities, and you're taxed at 15%, you're basically much better off and uh, you, know, you can absorb a greater So is that just clear, sort of the uh, difference between a flat tax and a progressive tax? Well, Sorry, what is Warren Buffett talking about? Sorry, so, okay, sorry, so, so, so I think we did this wrong. So Warren Buffett is saying, okay, so Warren Buffett should be taxed, according to this progressive thing, at a higher rate than the secretary, right? Just because of the 60,000 and 46 million, right, disparity. But because he makes his money through the capital gain, so through buying and selling stocks, that money is taxed at 15%, which is a lower rate than where she, she falls in the brackets, right? So he is charged a lower rate because of how he uh, uh, earns his money, right? So, I mean, if he was just making his 46 million as though like it was a wage, then he would be like way up here in the top bracket. But because this money comes through capital gains, which has a lower rate, his, uh, tax rate is lower. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that a flat tax though? Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a flat tax. There is some exemption. So if your net worth is like below a certain amount, then the capital gains only tax at 10%. But for the majority of our people, it's going to be 15, right? So yeah, it's basically a flat tax on net gain. Yeah. And, and the reason it's helpful to know this is because, you know, the two sides of the equation, the spending side and the taxing side, don't always add up. And here they tend to not add up very well. Um, so we have what's called a deficit, an annual deficit. Um, because what ends up happening is, you know, all this spending in, the, in that pie chart tends to dwarf uh, the amount we take in from taxes, whether it's income tax or corporate tax or, um, or capital gains tax. Um, and so a deficit, uh, very simply, in a given year, in a calendar year, um, is the amount you spend. spend more than that takes in, right? So it spends at 200 bucks and the deficit is 100 bucks. That's, I, mean, I, I don't think it, you could explain it any other way. So we have another term though that gets thrown around a lot. And this is the national debt, right? And the debt is the sum of all the annual deficits. So does that make sense? So let me just give a very, very brief example. So let's say in 2000, okay, our deficit was at $10. So we took in 100 bucks, we spent 110. So the deficit is at 10 bucks. And then in 2001, the deficit was 20 bucks. Then in 2001, at the end of 2001, the debt is 30 bucks. Is that, is that clear? I think, yeah. With the interest or not? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so there would be some uh, interest on this at $10, so like maybe you have to pay like 1% interest or something, so this might become 11, right, yeah. And then you'll have a, a greater national debt. It's a very good answer. So you know, my, my uh, nerdy joke here is that the, for the engineers in the room, the debt is basically the integral of the deficit function. That's good, right? Yeah. No love there? No one <laughs> Well, okay, I tried. So, so the point is, it, it's important not to conflate these two terms because they are different and they, they mean very different things. You can have uh, a very unsustainable and really large debt even though your deficit may be non-existent, right? And, and vice versa. 
All right, so everyone's good with those. Sorry there's all these at definition. You just have to do them before we get into it. So this is a graph now, okay, of U.S. annual deficit. So I just, let's just see here. This is the green is the spending, the outlays, okay? The blue line is the receipts, and the red down here is the surplus or deficit. So, by the way, surplus is the exact opposite of a deficit. So a surplus is when you take in 100 bucks, but you only spend 90. Okay, so for a few years in here, uh, we had a surplus, uh, but basically, as you can see, all the other times, we're basically at a deficit. So this goes up to 1940 in RC. And this is only up to 2008. That's what we, uh, that this graph was up to there. So this is just, we just wanted to sort of show the chart and, uh, but, but it's, we're not running huge, huge deficit. I mean, this is a, during the end of uh, World War uh, II, so that was huge. general trends you can take from this graph. I mean, there are a few interesting things, and, and some that will become bigger topics as the semester progresses. One thing you can easily notice is that for you know a good uh, what 20 year period or so, our deficit seemed pretty low and pretty stable, right? I mean, it's almost like a flat line. And then, you know, kind of in the early 70s, you see the deficit start to grow and grow, and as a result, that's had a big impact on our national debt now. You go to, is it in New York City? There's a, there's a debt clock yep. that goes up all the time. Yeah, you change our spending patterns, we just continue to collect the debt. Right, exactly. And so we're in the same problem as any college student. 
in a certain way. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're the, we are, but we have the ability to change. Yeah. College student doesn't even have the ability. Oh, they're yeah, screwed. no, for I mean, sure. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're really screwed, right? But at least, at least here there's like a choice. You oh, could, you could sure. do something. Yeah. Like, yeah. But no, very, very good analysis. And, and the fundamental crux of today's class was, you know, how can Facebook policies affect economic growth, right? Because all this talk mm -hmm. about, like, debt and deficits and stuff, you know, it's interesting, but, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really say a whole lot. At the end of the day, what's the bottom line, right? How, how does it affect unemployment? So these are just, like, um, very, very brief graphs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the yeah, deficit divided by the GDP. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's about, uh, this, this is about, like, 2004, 2005, about 10 percent, and that's where we are now. But yeah, I love this, because all of a sudden, it's way less imposing, right? I mean, look at what we're wearing before. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so we have about a, a deficit is about a trillion or so dollars a year, and the GDP is about 14 trillion, so we're a little under 10 percent each year, right? And um, and then we have, this is the, uh, the GDP, this is the yeah, debt to GDP, and again, this is projected, and I would not necessarily say this is going to happen, but this is about where I would so like 65 percent. So the debt, right, is the sum of all the deficits, right? So it's going to be much higher than what the deficit is, right? So in this case, it's about probably 10 trillion dollars, 11 trillion dollars out of a 14 trillion. Yeah, and, and, and once again, you know, the graph changes pretty dramatically. All of a sudden, look back there at like World War II, 120 percent. Okay. So here we go. So how can fiscal policy, right? So this was the taxes and spending, right? How can that affect the deficit, economic growth, unemployment, and recession? So two terms here are new. I mean, obviously, unemployment is basically the amount of people looking for work, right? So it's the it's the amount of people who cannot find a job divided by the amount of people who are in the labor force. So that means who are working or looking for a job, right? So right now, the unemployment rate, I don't know if anyone knows it. Anyone know? 8.5. 8.5. 8.5%, right? And, um, in a recession, uh, the yeah, technical definition is two quarters of negative GDP growth. So a quarter is obviously uh, three months in a year, right? So if we have two quarters back to back, so two consecutive quarters when GDP, which is basically the total income of the country, right, goes down, then uh, basically it's declared that the country's in a recession. Okay. So fiscal policy can affect you know these four aspects of the economy. In different ways, and, and realistically, there's a debate on, on how it does affect it, and, and there's multiple sort of perspectives and models and approaches people take. Um, economics, unlike physics and chemistry, you know, the, the science is not like hard and fast, right? So, which is why there's this big debate on, on what direction to take. But fundamentally, um, to make things simple, you can break it down into two sort of distinct ideologies or, or frameworks by which to approach um, how fiscal policy affects the economy. So, one is um, Fresh water and salt water, so use those terms? Uh, that's, that's kind of what it is. So we'll, we'll just, we won't use, like, uh, we won't define the term yet. So let's just, like, break down and maybe we'll get a future or something, right? So one approach um, involves government investment. So so one approach would say uh, basically the government could invest money, right, to, um, to basically increase the spending, right, which would help grow the economy. Right, so I mean, basically the intuition here. So. Let me do a quick example that uh, maybe people can, it might be easier to relate to. So uh, one of us owns a brewery, right? It's not me, it's him, right? He owns a brewery, right? And he has a demand of 100, uh, you know, whatever, kegs, let's say, okay? And it takes Rommel 100 workers to produce those. So the economy is going well, and like business is just going great. This is a situation one. But something happens in the economy, there's some shock, and we get to this new situation, and the demand has gone down to 50 kegs. Okay? What do you guys think Rahul's probably going to do in this very contrived example? He'll fire half the people, right? So we have 50 workers now. So the question is now, what steps could the government take, right, to try to move back from situation two to situation one, and how could it use fiscal policy to go from here to here, to reduce the unemployment and stop the recession? Because presumably this has happened because there's a recession and people are you know, spending less money on you know, tax or something. Yeah, so actually, um, let's kind of open up to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but. Right, buys the 50 kegs. The 
government buys 15 tanks, and then Rommel uh, rehires uh, 15 people. So that's definitely one option. Um, what's another option? The government could raise the net in another way. Basically, you could give some money to like his tax credit so yeah. people have money to spend on those tanks. Okay. Yeah, so here's the bad indirectly. So the government, let's say, gives uh, money to people, right, and then they go to Rommel and buy the tanks. Okay? Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah. The government can make 50 other jobs and the workers can take those jobs instead. Okay, so government could, let's say, spend money um, fixing Houston's roads, right? And then the <laughs> 50 people go work there. Okay, good. Anyone else? From the Max Gary. Uh, the government could commandeer the brewery. <laughs> output become 100 kegs? Okay. <laughs> Certainly a viable option. <laughs> I don't know how to spell common deer. Common deer. <laughs> and it could use it through subsidies. The government could get subsidies. Yeah, yeah. Pay all the so right. what kind of group that is there for? Well, it could eliminate the middlemen. Or are we going to separate the seven? Subsidies, so, so that's the that's other yeah, 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 part. Yeah. You know, government could lower the tax rate. Right. <laughs> definitely get so, so, so the uh, brewery has to pay a certain amount of like, tax on its profit. So if the government like reduces the taxes and they'll have a, a more money to spend, they'll bring in uh, more people and then uh, things will go well. The government can reduce the taxes. Or conversely, if they reduce income taxes, that would be reducing corporate taxes. Yeah, if they reduce income taxes, people have more money in their pockets, um, you know, willing to spend more on, on the beer. So here they're gonna reduce the income tax, okay. Um, I think, yeah, this is basically it. There's one, There's one more. One more, yeah. It's Though gonna maybe hard to hear. Yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. set it up well. Yeah. Example. So the uh, brewery has to follow like all these really, really like tough EPA regulations on their emissions and, and like labor here, standards. Yeah. They have to like pay everyone like hundred dollars an hour, right? And like they have to like buy from like a plasma TV because the government <laughs> says they do. So. They tend to be grouped in basically two distinct ways, right? So, um, so I guess, yeah, that's basically. that's fundamentally what it comes down to. So you just call this like a group A, yeah. right, and group B. So these are basically the two uh, suites of you know uh, uh, policy options, right, that people could. Have. And and you know maybe you're asking why why are they grouped in this way? Well, there tends to be a certain similarity here, right? Lower taxes, reduce regulations. Kind of a similar thing we're getting getting laws out of the way and the first one is more active we want government to get more involved the second one is more like you want to get step away from so is that clear and, 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 and this like micro example could be applied to the entire economy right so you can also think of this as like the usa and before its gdp was like 14 trillion and now it's like 13.5 so how do we go back up it's the exact same thing so are there any questions on uh, any of the seven uh policy options that is commandeer actually included in the in the yes. first one? No, so so <laughs> commandeer would be like school C, okay. right? And this <laughs> like government literally goes in there and takes over. And, and, and this, by the way, uh, you could see this happening, right? Uh, some people would argue that uh, this happened with like the uh, bank bailout or like or uh, with yeah with the auto industry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean this is like very possible. This is basically where the government begins like managing the company itself and being like, you have to produce 100 kegs of beer and you're going to hire 100 people whether you're like making. So that would kind of be group B, yeah. Good, good point. Any other questions about these seven policy options? Okay. Um, so I guess now we can uh, get to sort of the current uh, deficit, right? Sort of how we got there. Um, yeah, yeah. We were, we were briefly talking about it earlier, um, and you know we're, we're going back to this because we're gonna we're gonna get to this. Um, well, I guess in a minute or two, um, get to using 
policies to be A or B to address our current economic problems. But you know, to kind of get there, we have to step back and see what's kind of happened in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and the budget plays a big role in that. So you know, in, in the earlier graph that you saw, you saw like- Let's go back to that graph. Yeah, that would be useful. Right here, so it's clear. Yeah, yeah, so, so Yeah, so, so right in here we have a surplus, and then all of a sudden we have a deficit. So we're gonna see how did we go from here to here, and then basically the graph has, has kind of continued a little bit this way. So like how are we going <coughs> into this like negative area? That's right. basically the question we're asking. So, and this again was not made by us, so we're not trying to be a partisan or anything. This is uh, from the nearby. Oh. Right? So, so yeah, so basically, you know, um, against the backdrop of our current like debt and deficit conversation, um, we talked about the fact that there's a core set of policy proposals that kind of um, has, has shaped how our deficit has played out ever since our surplus in uh, basically the start of the, the first decade. Um, so what we see is a combination of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the, the tax cuts. Um, so in uh, it was 2001, uh, the sort of top income tax bracket um, was lowered from like 37, 35, um, and then uh, sort of subsequent uh, drops in, in uh, taxation rates going downward. Um, um, and we saw basically increases in non-defense discretionary spending. So um, this is basically the, uh, the Medicare, well, Medicare drug benefits you brought up, but um, so, 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 so yeah, this uh, 608 is, is, is basically like, um, let's say like more people begin using food stamps, yeah. right? Or there's like more investment like research, or I mean, President Bush passed um, the yeah, No Child I Left Behind, right, in education, so that increased spending in education, something like that. And then kind of rounding that out, towards the end, you saw the bank bailouts, Tarp, and we'll talk more about those in a few weeks. Next week. Next week. Next week. And, uh, well, two weeks, I guess. Oh, there's no problem. Break. And then this Medicare drug benefit. Um, we'll get into that. Healthcare is in the second section of the class. You're hearing a lot about this. But the point is, it's basically just four or five policy decisions that have basically, uh, you know, caused a pretty big impact on the debt deficit. So it doesn't really take a lot. Right. And then, of course, you have the Obama stimulus uh, package, which he passed at the beginning of his administration. Then he did the health reform and, and so on. There have there are been other things since and this is, I think, from, this is a little bit old, so they're probably like, this graph is probably come more down yeah. here, right? Yeah. right. So, so anyways, so we just wanted to sort of set up, this is sort of like how we got to the situation we're in now, where basically uh, the deficit is exploding, right? The yeah, debt is really getting pretty large. So, and we are in a dismal economic situation, and you have a question. Uh, yeah, for this chart, are, are like, the total cost of the new policies, is this projected into 2017 when it, you know, it says inclining projections, or is this only through the, the whenever they created this chart? No, 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 it's, it's all the way, it's all okay. the way. But projecting into 2017. But yeah, but it's assuming that, you know, I mean, it's not taking into account that in like 2013 or whatever, like uh, President Obama could like pass like a new budget, which oh, yeah, like no. includes like a trillion more dollars in spending, yeah. right? Or Conversely, you could pass a budget that you know cuts a trillion dollars in spending, yeah. so that's not. But under current policy change, there's only 152 uh, yeah. billion, Basically or billion go, more in defense and health reform. Right, changes, yeah. and it just goes out. Yeah. So, question uh, now for the class is sort of given what we talked about here, where we are today, we just thought we would kind of open it up and say, what do you guys think? Sort of how could we go about trying to fix the economy? and address kind of the debt and the deficit issue, like which should be addressed first, how do we do that, um, any, any yeah. thoughts on that? And, and, and just to give you, um, so just to give you a little backdrop, so we have right now, we've so far presented two different issues with, with fiscal policy, or that fiscal policy has to deal with, okay? One is this debt and deficit issue, right? So um, obviously, so having, this is a good graph. yeah, yeah, it's a good way of putting it up. So fiscal policy, there's two main goals, right? So you have to control the debt and deficit, but at the same time, you have to keep the economy growing and keep unemployment low. And any sort of decision you make, uh, any combination of A, B, or C, has to sort of manage those two goals well. And what we're seeing now is there's, there's a great debate on how to do exactly that in the two sort of different options. So maybe, um, yeah, so this kind of summarizes what we had before. So we want to hear from you guys in the context of sort of the, the beer example, but going more macro, you know, what is your approach? Like if you, you know, you're sitting there in, in the Oval Office, you get to decide what is the national economic policy, right? So if you had to go out and make a decision right now, I and mean, what is your general feeling? So, okay, so, so this is 
to reduce the government deficit, right? So basically, as we said, the government <coughs> deficit is spending minus revenue, right? So if the revenue goes up, the deficit will go down. So that so that would certainly address goal number one up there of reducing, or I mean, in, in part, I'd address that goal. Okay. Uh, any other? Yeah. Uh, what's your name? Lauren. Lauren. Um, first of all, in similar ways, Kim, um, getting rid of the Bush tax cuts and um, regular reforming the tax code so that capital gains um, do suffer a bigger tax bracket. So because it is usually for the people who earn very high wages or very wealthy. And um, we, you know, we saw during the Clinton era an actual um, surplus, which is kind of the tax code that we want to return to when we've seen a deficit result since the um, Bush tax cuts. And also um, to create jobs that have a lasting impact, ones that will um, stay in the economy rather than quick Nest, like some infrastructure jobs end up disappearing within like three years, ones that have a longer impact on the economy. So, investing in jobs and changing the tax code to be actually progressive since we've gone more into regressive era because we haven't changed the capital gains tax code. So, Lauren is saying to try to address both goals. So, the top goal is similar to a Julian's, but also sort of like reforming the entire tax code. Uh, that's something that has been tried. And the last major tax reform was in 1986. So we said the 25th anniversary, um, and so that, that's definitely one thing. And then creating jobs, creating these sort of like value add, long term jobs, kind of shifting the US economy uh, so that we have you know, jobs in the foreseeable future. Certainly uh, one, one policy option. Any other thoughts? I think I actually disagree with you, <laughs> Joe. Do you cut government spending? Do you reform entitlements? It's such a huge part of money that we spend in this country. If you reform that kind of stuff, then you can't get the government debt. So that's one way to do it. Joe makes a very good point. He said, let's look back at this graph. Look, 40% of the government budget is spent on insurance, which is the fees of three it's Easier said than done. Easier said than done. It's right. So, 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 so Joe is saying if we can somehow control this and like maybe bring it down to like 37%, 36%, then uh, the government deficit would go down, right? Because spending uh, goes down and tax revenues would have stayed the same, theoretically, so then deficit would go down. Lauren wants to respond. To Reducing the social safety net would only mean that the, we have uh, less demand that can be provided in the economy because the people who are spending the most money and stimulating the economy therefore have to pay $100 for a prescription rather than have some of that cost absorbed by the government who regulates the markets that are making medicine so expensive. So, so, okay. so the companies are entitled. So the intuition, the um, so the uh, counterpoint now is that <laughs> if you reduce the entitlements, right, then people will have less money to spend because they have to spend more money on their uh, doctor, right, because the government is spending less, right? So then because they have a less to spend on the doctor, they buy less kegs and then less people have a job. That's uh, uh, Lawrence's point. Uh, does anyone else want to jump in? I'm, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that we get rid of entitlements. Oh, no. But if you reform them in such a way that, you know, there's, if you look at the numbers, they're going out of control. The amount that, uh, you know, the percentages that we're spending on, entitlements especially, have been going out of control for I don't know how long. So if we figure out a way to make that number stop increasing, you know, there's a, I think that's a huge part of the problem. I feel like in order to make those numbers stop increasing, you would have to increase expenditures first and later on where you got that. First, you need to, in a recession, you cannot cut down spending. That just does not happen. Like so, so, her point is, you know, like, okay, so we're in a recession and we have to figure out a way to fix the jobs crisis first and then move to the deficit. Certainly, one argument uh, to be made. I think, do you have your hand up? A couple more hands. Yeah, yeah, I would just want to make comments about, like, how much changing, like, health policy, I think, can cut, um, like, Medicare, Medicaid um, costs without necessarily so much more on health care than countries where people have like greater quality of life and live longer and have less disease. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of what you guys are talking about, Joe, you mentioned entitlements, you mentioned health care, um, and then you mentioned sort of the, the long term versus short term. What's interesting is because we're going to explore a lot of these individually in depth, um, which is why we wanted to make the first half a little bit broad, so it kind of sets uh, sort of the context for all these discussions. So yes, we will definitely be talking about and, and yeah, that's a very, very good point. I mean, if, I mean, if there's a way to reduce spending on healthcare and keep uh, the outcomes the exact same, no one would say not to do it, right? So I mean, if we can figure out
figure out a way to do that. Yeah, but no, that's a perfect perfect solution. Did you, I think you had your hand up. Oh, um, yeah, I was also going to say if the rest of the infrastructure of the country um, can be changed so that people have less necessity, less, less reliance on impediments, then mm -hmm. that would be another way to do it. So, so the intuition, this is actually a very good point. I hadn't thought of this. So the intuition here is, like, let's say that, you know, People like below a certain income uh, threshold, right, rely on entitlement. So if we can bring more people out of this, sort of passes a threshold in some way, then they'll be like less reliant on the entitlements. Is that your point? Yeah. Okay. This is a very very good point. Uh, there there could definitely be ways to say okay somehow supplement these people's income so they move out of here and they are now like relying on food stamps and so on. Joe. Isn't that kind of from the same logic though? This is the kind of idea of supplementation. Like because people don't have this, they you know they created entitlements to make sure people don't have to start again. Yeah. Isn't when you're trying to do what you just said essentially kind of coming from the same place? You know, bring them income. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty similar, but I mean something like um, I mean we recently finally increased the minimum wage pretty significantly, and that's something that winds up allowing. She's saying, plus also the fact that you sort of have the cycle of um, people, you know, getting food stamps, and then all right, then you're in a deficit, so you're like trying to figure out reform your program. But instead of just like taking these people out of the bracket by, for example, providing them with education and providing them with the facilities that they need, so they're out, and once they're out, they're not gonna come back to the food stamp. So that's from sort of eradicated. Yeah. So like making like long long term investments, like she mentioned, like not just short term, like long term investments. Like even though you're in deficit, doesn't mean you should be cutting down. Like, education and right. important things like that that help people get out of poverty. So, so, so the intuition here, right, is if we can provide people, let's say, with like a better education and you know, maybe some sort of like better other sort of policies, they can like move out of this area, right, they can come into here, become a tax paying individuals, right, the entitlement spending goes down, cuts the deficit. Max. Another long term investment we can make is in the realm of uh, our culture of health. If we stop subsidizing corn so that it's not pumped into everything we eat, people would have healthier lives. If the government subsidized fresh fruits, or uh, farmers out, you know, the orange grows in California, Florida, they plant strawberries. So, so, uh, so, Max, are you supporting a tax on a soda here? <laughs> coming out right now? Sure, so it's tax it. Okay, okay so Max coming out for tax on soda. Max, I tax on healthy food and subsidize healthy. Food. Yeah, so uh, the only issue with Max's brilliant proposal <laughs> is politically uh, it is as passable as cutting Social Security, okay, i.e. not passable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but see, that's such an interesting because that's what so many private companies are doing by making their, so in order not to pay for insurance and not pay for their medical bills, they're making them more healthy. Like, all right, we're going to subsidize you for like, your gym, you know, we're going to give you like good organic products and like have this pedometer like, so you walk more and you like, can count yeah. and then you can get points. Maybe the government can do the same so that they don't have to spend for Medicaid. But I mean, you're right. Like then, on lobbying or not, whatever. 